going. Uh, so thank you everyone uh, for joining. You're here at uh, Data Science DC. Uh, we're here to, to watch uh, Michael McCourt from Intel and SIGOPT talk about managing machine learning metrics. Uh, if you didn't mean to come to this presentation, you're still more than welcome to stay. We would love to have you. Um, for those that uh, aren't familiar, data, data Science DC is a part of Data Community DC, uh, a nonprofit umbrella organization for several uh, data science meetups, uh, mostly relegated to the Washington DC area. But of course, over the last year and a half where we've been remote, uh, we are no longer geographically constrained. Uh, you can see our, our meetups here on the left. Uh, you can go to datacommunitydc.org uh, to visit our blog calendar, our newsletter, or you can tweet at us at datacommunitydc uh, on Twitter. Uh, we also have uh, Facebook and a LinkedIn group as well that you should be able to search and find. We do have a code of conduct here. Um, <clears throat> I have a, a rule against reading slides to everyone, so I will, will summarize, but uh, we are dedicated to providing uh, a, a safe and respectful environment for, for everyone uh, that is free from harassment and bullying. Uh, so in general, uh, be nice. If um, you see something if that makes you uncomfortable, if you think somebody else is having a hard time, uh, feel free to send a message uh, directly to uh, Jeff Hale, uh, Martin Skrzanski or myself. Uh, I'm Tommy, but uh, it'll say, it says Data Community DC, uh, and we'll take action where we can. Uh, you can also email me at thomas at datacommunitydc.org. Um, we'll do what we can for you. Uh, but we have a, a zero tolerance policy on any sort of harassing behavior. We also uh, want to create a uh, inclusive and equitable environment. Uh, if we were still in person, this would be the time where I would ask everyone to look around the room and see the variety of uh, races and genders uh, that come to our, our meetups. And so our pledge to you all is that we would like the lineup of our speakers uh, over the course of a year to reflect the diversity of the community itself. And we ask you to hold us accountable to that. So if you have concerns about uh, you know, our, our speaker lineup and you don't think we're being inclusive enough, uh, you know, please tell us. We're here for you. We're here for the whole community. Uh, and we, we will make changes. And people have done it in the past. And we have responded. Uh, so Data Community DC is uh, free to you, but it is not free to, to run. Uh, so we have community sponsors who are, have been gracious enough to, to donate money to, to keep the proverbial lights on. Um, when we were in person, uh, not only did they pay, they still pay for our administrative costs, but they also paid for pizza. Uh, and someday uh, we will go back to meeting in person and they will pay for pizza again. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, it's our uh, administrative costs and uh, they pay for the Zoom license that allows us to hold these talks for you all. Um, so just a few uh, announcements here. Uh, so first of all, uh, if you go to youtube.com slash data community DC, we have videos posted uh, from data science DC as well as our other meetups. Um, we'll post these links in the chat. Uh, we also have a Slack channel. So I would encourage folks uh, to go visit us uh, bit.ly slash DC2 Slack. Um, if you visit us on the Slack channel and you have uh, your own community announcements, if you're looking to hire, if you're looking to get hired, if you're holding an event, if you just want to make friends, drop in the Slack, Slack channel and uh, post an announcement uh, and try and get some engagement from folks there. Um, we are having another meetup for Data Science DC in September. Uh, right here it says it is in the works. Bolo, be on the lookout. Um, but right before we started, Jeff informed me that he's posted our uh, September talk. Uh, Jeff, I don't know if you want to say what that is. Uh, yeah, it's about uh, Hopsworks and feature stores. Uh, it should be a great meetup. So check it out. I'll put the link here in the chat. Awesome. Um, we've also got uh, Data Week DC coming up October 6th to 10th. Um, 
it's another free event. What we're trying to do is just concentrate a lot of different uh, meetups uh, during the same week uh, to try and get some more community engagement. If you want to attend, if you want to see the roster of what we've got lined up, if you would like to participate, if you would like to sponsor, uh, please go to dataweekdc.com and check it out. Oops. Along those lines, uh, it's as I said, it's 100% free for attendees, uh, and the dataweekdc.com is where you would go for the calendar to see what's going on there. Uh, we also, on our website, uh, datacommunitydc.org slash gallery, uh, have a nascent community gallery we're trying to build of data visualizations, data products, things from folks in the community. So those of you that are attending here um, to uh, be able to showcase your work for those in the community. Um, so check it out and that, I'll put these links in the chat, uh, but that uh, Google form, the second link there is how you would sign up to be able to submit a work. Uh, and with that, uh, I am going to stop sharing and I'm gonna turn it over uh, to you, Michael, to begin presenting. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak. And in particular, uh, it's really amazing to see uh, how much uh, data science and the community has grown uh, in D.C. Twelve years ago, I lived uh, in D.C. working at the, the DNC uh, for um, Organizing for America. And I, I, I loved it. It was an amazing time, amazing opportunity, but there was not uh, terribly much uh, uh, sizable uh, work being done on data science in, in DC at the time. So seeing everything that's popped up recently is really impressive and really exciting. And uh, congratulations to all of you for making that happen. Uh, and thank you uh, for having me here today. Obviously, originally it was Megna who was supposed to be here. She, uh, unfortunately, uh, was busy uh, this week and next week and was unable to make it. So uh, thank you for having me in her stead. Uh, I'm gonna talk today about a topic, I'm just calling it here, managing ML metrics. It's a relatively open-ended topic. Uh, what are ML metrics? What are we thinking about here? Uh, the, the goal of the talk is to bring up a lot of stuff that I think we, we all often think about and push from some of these uh, core ideas. What is it to train a model? What is it to tune a model? And then push a little bit further and say, okay, but uh, how, how do we see it be successful when we actually push it to production? Um, I'll say that I grew up as a researcher I was definitely somebody who was thinking more on the uh, developing novel ML methods or, or what have you, or even back in the day, kernel methods. Um, and for the last six years, uh, while I've been at SIGOPT, uh, you'll see a little similar in the bottom right-hand corner, I've been thinking a lot more about uh, what is it that makes ML successful and, and models more broadly maybe than just ML models, successful to people uh, around the world. It's been a, a exciting journey. Um, let me, let me click. There we are. Uh, SIGOPT, the product uh, itself is a SaaS tool for uh, ML AI developers, among others. I should mention that many of our users are not uh, ML AI people, but, but people who want to use maybe ML AI to make big things happen. Um, and uh, we try and help our users conduct intelligent experimentation during model development. Uh, broadly speaking, the goal of intelligent experimentation is to say there are arbitrarily many things you can do when you work to build ML models, a lot of decisions you need to make. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Intelligent experimentation is somehow parsing this space of options in a way so as to make uh, progress feasibly in the time that you have available to you. And uh, so as to produce a model that is going to be successful when you're moving it from development to production. Uh, SIGOPT was headquartered in San Francisco, but is now a fully remote entity uh, operating within Intel. We were acquired, uh, boy, 10 months ago now. It's crazy to think it's been that long. It feels like just last day. But I mean, I guess for the last 16 months, time has been a confusing idea. So no surprise there. SIGOPT, the uh, company, and in reality, I was going to say SIGOPT today. I have an incorrect uh, header here. Um, this particular bullet was supposed to talk about 
um, SIGOPT engineering in particular and how the engineering team is comprised of uh, five platform people and three research people um, and myself, the head of engineering. And actually we just hired two new platform people. So the team's about to be up to seven. Uh, we're always looking for outstanding uh, talent, both on the platform side and on the research side, as well as interns. So if you're interested, there'll be some contact information at the end. Also, of course, SIGOPT.com. Click there we are. So what I'd like to start talking about today is uh, the model training process, something that I think everybody who's doing ML is is sort of familiar with. What is the model training process? Model training process is a series of decisions. In order to build a model, you need to somehow choose the data, choose the data that you are going to try and have your model learn about. What decisions need to be made during this? Uh, data decision. Well, we need to think about what sources data might come from, also versioning of data, cleaning, feature engineering. Feature engineering is arguably somehow the most important element or often the element which can make or break your model building process. I mentioned here data augmentation, obviously that's very big in, comp oops, sorry, in computer vision, but is uh, sort of becoming more prominent in other areas as well. Um, and, and here's a, an example below of some data augmentation, which proved useful on uh, an example involving recognizing various traffic signs. So part of model training is choosing data. Part of model training I think I don't know how to do this, uh, is choosing a model. And here I put nine examples of, uh, you could say models, maybe you could say frameworks. Uh, obviously, each of these are somehow different, uh, but Keras, PyTorch, TensorFlow, these are all neural network, maybe oriented. Uh, LightGBM, XGBoost, and, and parts of scikit-learn are more focused on decision trees. Of course, there's no uh, kernel methods up there, not surprising, it's not terribly popular anymore, but um, uh, choosing the model that you're going to learn with is a key decision, and making that decision effectively can be uh, a key element in the success of your model. Choosing the loss function, I'm putting this here front and foremost because this is a decision. We're going to come back to this in a second. I put here a bunch of loss functions, which are commonly Defined. I think these are all available in, in scikit-learn, if I'm not mistaken. Um, when we think about loss functions, what does this mean? Somehow this means how, how, how are we going to judge the success of the model learning about the data? So we need to pick the data, we need to pick the model, we need to pick what does it mean for this model to be successful on this data. Uh, and then in turn, you need to conduct, darn it, this optimization process uh, where you're going to minimize this loss function. You're going to find the version of the model which minimizes a given loss function on the data. And you know, I've written here in this sort of very simple sense, model.fit. Oftentimes, I, I don't know about you guys, I often think of it as no more complicated than this. Of course, it's extremely complicated behind the scenes. We won't talk necessarily about how, but this is the model training process. It's a series of decisions. What we're going to get into today is, is what's beyond that, what's beyond just the training process. And I'm going to push this button one time. We're going to see what's going to happen. Okay, there we are. Success in production is more than just model.fit. And I'm going to push it. I'm going to push it one time. There we go. Okay. Um, additional metrics are often created to define success when we're talking about going to production. It's not just about, boy, can I choose the loss function and then train to get my answer for the loss function. I think in reality, you know, many of us uh, know this, we've all been through this process. The goal of this talk is to think about this in a series of steps and a series of broader decisions than the, just the decisions that go into the training process. And uh, in particular, I put here quotes around this. I don't know if this is quotes. This is just something we think about internally here at SIGOPT, that um, the use of metrics allows us to quantify success or at least talk about success. Metrics don't have to be numbers. They often are numbers, but they don't have to be numbers. They could be yes, no statements. They could be a preference between two different outcomes. And these, these metrics could then be somehow defined implicitly. That's perfectly fine. But somehow they do talk about framing decisions, framing what success means. And that's often what I think of, at least when I talk about metrics. Uh, I put here this, this graph talking about uh, life cycle of a metric. In reality, I think there could be a lot more steps 
going on here than just these steps. But at the base case, somehow you need to define a raw sense of what success means. But your opinion alone isn't often going to be enough. There's going to be some amount of discussion with people to define, oh, okay, well, uh, is this quick to compute? Is this appropriate for our set of circumstances? Does this encapsulate things that we value? You're going to need to validate whether this metric actually relates to success for the circumstances that you're interested in dealing with. You're going to want to experiment with it, I think, many times because uh, yeah, how precise can you be with your given metric? You may have, I mean, when we talk about loss, for instance, and this is this is a floating point number, right? 16 digits of precision. But I mean, in any real study, we actually have that much precision. Well, how does noise play a role? Understanding that is a key definition of what the, 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 the value of the metric. And then in turn, somehow, uh, you don't just want to study a metric, you want to find your best outcomes for your metric. So this is part of our discussion about moving from development to production. And we're going we're gonna to dig into this a little bit further. Let me take a pause now. I'm going to take a look at the chat and see. And no questions yet. If there are questions, periodically I'll take a pause. There are a few natural break points here in the talk. If people have questions or points of dispute, I'd love it. Let's bring it up. I definitely want this to be uh, 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 as, as uh, interactive, as much of a discussion as we can make it. Uh, because in my mind, that's the part, that's the meetup. This isn't, this isn't just a lecture. We're not at ICML here. We can have a little chat. All right. So, all right, let me, no, I didn't. Okay. Now I'm going to push it one time. No, I'm going to push it two times. Here we, Michael, you got a there question. we go. You, you question, got a question yes. here if you want. Yeah. From Aaron. Uh, yes, yeah, so Aaron, I imagine you're going, boom, boy, boy, you predicted this slide exactly perfectly. Correct. That is absolutely something we're going to talk about, the difference between training validation. We're also going to talk, we're going to push that a little bit further. So the excellent, you had it, you nailed it. Uh, and I put here a quick little slide. I talked a moment ago about optimizing. So we talked about some training metrics. You know, we could talk about these loss functions, uh, cross entropy, loss function, F1, square, a whole bunch of different things. And at the end of the day, these training metrics, again, are defined on the training data. Somehow your goal is uh, minimize this loss. You want, you want to find the version of the model that you're studying that minimizes this loss. There is, of course, this meta question, what model should I be building? Under what circumstances should I be conducting my training? That's a meta question. That is here. We're getting into this validation metrics topic. We're going to get to that. In, in, the, in the first point, though, I think it's worth pointing out when we talk about training metrics, and in particular, when we talk about optimizing training metrics, we are almost always nowadays, in many of these circumstances, really just talking about stochastic gradient descent. If you're talking support vector machines, yes, you've got your quadratic program. You can solve that any which way you want. You're probably feeling good. If you're talking about just basic linear regression, maybe there's some sort of analytic solution. I don't know if anybody really does the classic Bayes formulation and, and solves the normal equations anymore, but you can do that too, if you love your singular value decomposition. But in general, pretty much nowadays, I think most people say to themselves, I've got at least partial gradient information. It's at least a little bit accurate. And if I iterate for long enough, I'll eventually get to the, the answer. And there is really one answer here. When we talk about training, there is one answer. Is there actually one answer? No, there's not necessarily one answer. In some of these non-convex situations, you could arguably have uh, a whole bunch of different solutions. But for the most part, when we talk about solving these training problems, we're going to iterate until we find the answer. We sort of just think of that as, as the answer. That is the trained version of the model. Does it matter where we choose our initial location? It can. I'm not going to sit here and pretend it does it. It absolutely can. But I think we all just kind of ignore that for the most part. There's definitely been some research. I remember seeing uh, Anima Anand Kumar uh, speak at uh, NeurIPS maybe five years ago, six years ago. She was at one of the, one of the uh, uh, tutorial sessions talking about how, hey, I think this is an important thing. I think this is really important. I agree. I agree. I think that the initial starting location can be extremely important. We just don't seem to be really studying it at all. And, in the, and the only way I think that these initial locations really pop up, in my opinion, is when people talk about fine tuning. People talk about what is this, the, the, the transfer 
uh, not, maybe not transfer, and that's maybe not quite the right term. Maybe you could call it transfer learning or, or uh, something like that. But, but basically it's this idea that, hey, I have a fitted model. Now I just want to start from that and iterate slightly towards a slightly different version of my data. Maybe, maybe this month's data instead of last month's data. I think that's the one place where you see, really see initialization coming up. I see Doug Samuelson with a question. Can you handle optimizing the probability of being close to the solution rather than seeking a precise point optimum in a problem with lots of random errors and data. An incredible idea, an absolutely incredible idea. Could you theoretically do that? Probably. Could you actually do that? Very complicated. I think very complicated. You asked this question, probability of being close to the solution. And now, actually, this is, this is fantastic. We were going to get to this all the way down here. We're going to start it right now. What does it mean close? What does it mean for two things to be close? We could talk about proximity in parameter space. And when I say that, really, that's the proximity of two fitted models being close to each other by measuring the distance between their weights. I think you could absolutely talk. I think you absolutely could talk about that. But is that actually what you want to be talking about? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe what you actually mean is proximity in metric space. Can you, can you talk about, hey, I found a result. It has a training loss of 10 to the minus four. Uh, or I should say one E minus four. Uh, if I'm within two E minus four, is that good enough somehow? What is the probability of being there? I think you absolutely could talk about that. I don't know that people are doing that research right now. I feel like most of the research that's happening in this non-convex gradient-based optimization stuff is more about somehow saying, if I iterated for infinitely long, I would eventually iterate to quote unquote the answer. Um, but if somebody has, when I see here, somebody... Fantastic. Uh, M.E. Meslami, I, I'm not sure if I'm probably not saying your name correctly. Meslami has a archive article, it's point of a meetup. Here we are. We're passing the ideas around. We have fantastic ideas. I have not seen this before. I'm marking the effect. And let me copy that right to my little notes right here. Thank you very much for the heads up. Could be a very, very interesting note here talking about uh, sensitivity models based on random starting points. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Um, so uh, these uh, gradient-based methods are, are obviously extremely powerful. You know, when we're talking about neural network, what are we talking about? Half a billion unknowns, maybe. And still we get to some sort of answer. So clearly they're doing something. This is not really what I'm going to be talking about for most of today, however, because Turn it. Okay, I'm going to do the one more. There we go. Because exactly uh, as I think it was Aaron earlier commented, uh, training metrics are not the full picture. Validation metrics estimate model performance on unseen data. And when you hear the word tuning, we're usually talking about optimizing a validation metric. Um, we have here Doug, Doug commenting again, looking for a plateau with good values rather than a sharp point with a better value is a better approach in industrial quality control. Fantastic point. I absolutely love it. We will actually get to that in a little bit on the, on the production side. So not necessarily for the gradient based side, but in a little bit on this production side in just a little bit. Thank you for bringing that up. That's absolutely true. Looking for a nice, happy region of good outcomes is often better than one somehow very brittle outcome, which could marginally perform better. Fantastic point. So we have here validation metrics. I'm using this term validation metrics. I haven't introduced it yet. Let me, here we go. Let me show some examples of validation metrics. Again, I think these are swiped from SK Learn. The idea of a validation metric is to say, okay, I want to estimate how will my model which I've trained, I have trained my model in whatever way I've defined according to my training process earlier. How will that model likely perform when I, when I show it new data? Not just the data that I've trained on, but some new data. Uh, it could be uh, a held out data set, a validation data set. And oftentimes you're gonna see when you, when you sit in on any of these lectures, you sit in Andrew Ng's lecture online or other people's lectures here that we have in a meetup, you're gonna see people talking about, okay, I want my validation validation data set, you definitely should be using it. Here's a variety of metrics that scikit-learn recommends. When we talk about optimizing one of these metrics, though, one of these validation metrics, it can be a little nastier than when we talk about optimizing training metrics. I'm putting a, a picture here very nasty non-convex surface. Now, this is not an example of a, an actual validation problem. This is just a, a fake problem that people talk about sometimes in black box optimization settings. 
Validation problems, though, tend to be much nastier to optimize than training problems for a lot of reasons. One of them is because evaluating the validation metric one time is the cost of one entire training. So it's not just sort of uh, measuring the loss, it's the entire training is one evaluation of a, a proposed validation strategy. And then there's, there's a second element, which is you don't have gradient information. And you don't have a gradient information, arguably, for all kinds of reasons. Now, the nice people who wrote AutoGrad and the nice people who put all the automatic differentiation stuff in PyTorch, they may tell me otherwise. If one of you is in chat now, I will, I will take your punishment. That is fine. But by my money, I'm sorry, you just don't have, you don't have your gradient information when you're talking about validation metrics. And there's one key reason why I'm going to really stand by my point. When we talk about this meta space of defining the model that we want to study, you've got categorical parameters there. You've got categories, decisions like, gee, should I be using a neural network or a random force? How are you talking about gradient there? Gradient doesn't even mean anything there. In my opinion, it doesn't mean anything there. So I'm happy to have that discussion. But in my mind, you know, these validation metrics are always going to be much harder to optimize than the training metrics we're studying. Still, a key element of these validation metrics is that they are computable at training time. We do, we do have the ability to compute them. If we don't have the ability to compute them, I'm going to box those in a different category. We're going to talk about those in a little bit. All right, so we are going to say that these are computable. I'm going to put a minor pitch. This will be my one pitch for SIGOPT. SIGOPT can be used to optimize validation metrics. There it is. There's my one pitch for SIGOPT. Now, uh, in reality, how do we do this? Uh, we allow you to define these hyperparameters that you're interested in studying. We're going to talk about what hyperparameters are in a little bit, but oftentimes hyperparameters are things like your learning rate, your momentum, your uh, choice of stochastic gradient uh, descent algorithm. You're going to talk about uh, regularization strategies, maybe data normalization or augmentation strategy. All of these are hyperparameters. None of these had anything to do with just our raw training process before. This is this meta question. How do I choose my data? How do I augment my data? That's what we're trying to study when we talk about hyperparameters. SIGOPT has the ability to take in your information about what hyperparameters you'd want to study and proposes, hey, why don't you try this? You test this behind your sort of firewall here. We don't see anybody's data. You tell us how it went. We give you another suggestion. You tell us how it went. Another suggestion. You tell us how it went. That's the goal. That's the purpose of SIGOPT. I'll be frank with you guys. There are a lot of tools out there that do this. Many open source tools do this as well. I think SIGOPT, though, absolutely has the best hosted solution for this purpose. And I'll also throw out now, it's totally free to use for everybody in the world today, thanks to the Intel acquisition. Originally, we used to charge people crazy amount of money to use SIGOP. Today, Intel wants to give it out for free. And I'm not just, I'm not one of these crazy guys late night talking about, you know, 2 a.m. the TV, and I'm giving this away for free and it's crazy and I must be out of my mind. I, I mean, I'm excited. I'm very excited about this. We are able to right now give it out for free. You can sign up for it. I have a link at the end of this talk. I see a bunch of questions coming in here. Um, so uh, use it. Tell us if you like it. Tell us if you hate it. I want to hear that more than if you like it, please. I will also give a minor pitch to some friends of mine who have developed some outstanding open source packages. The Axe Bowtorch package, which has been built by Facebook. Uh, some good friends of mine are working on that. They're doing outstanding work there. If you really want an open source solution, not a hosted solution, that's a great solution. The Optuna project, some good friends of mine are working on that. They're at Preferred Networks out in Tokyo doing absolutely fantastic work. Um, and I'll also throw out the Bayesopt project. It's a little bit older, but it's in C. So if you need it in C, not in Python, it's a fantastic project. Ruben's a good friend of mine. There's some really, really great stuff open source out there. But if you're looking for a hosted solution, I definitely think SIGOP's a great tool. And let me see here. We've got some questions. How is industry standardizing metrics output by ML model? I'm not sure they are, to be perfectly frank. I think on one hand, oftentimes um, metrics are inherited from academia. So I think oftentimes academics 
come up with a metric that either can be studied nicely theoretically or is at least proposed nicely from a conceptual standpoint and those often trickle their way into industry i do think that there are some industry specific metrics that exist what i don't think is that they are brought across all industries i do think that they tend to have very specific very applications oh did i just hit echo there sorry about that uh where they where they work and where they make sense so i'm going to say that i don't know that there is great standardization yet i think that some communities see consistency for instance i'll say the imagery construction community has this this psnr quality quantity which is uh sort of commonly described across all people who are doing imagery construction but again that's one of these theoretical or i shouldn't say theoretical but academically motivated ones so i'm not sure that industry has fully locked it down yet and frankly if it's going to happen it's going to happen at meetups it's going to happen because folks get together talk about what they're all doing and something gels uh, from from the grassroots side of things. So in my opinion, is this a good time to ask how SIGOP compares to uh, There We Are Beautiful? I, I think I just gave um, Aaron a, a, a comment um, about that. There are some other tools out there. I think that SIGOP has a, a, a very few, a few very useful features which allow us to try and address some of, in particular, some of these other topics. We're going to talk about guard wheel metrics, production metrics in a little bit. But like I said, those other tools out there are fantastic. There, it, there's not like, um, you know, oh my God, we've invented something that nobody else can touch. Everybody in the community is doing really outstanding work right now. I'm, I'm extremely fortunate to be part of this Bayesian optimization community where there's a really a fantastic amount of outstanding work being done. And I'm also very fortunate to have the financial support of the company to go out and organize organize events uh, where there are workshops on, on basic optimization, we all get together and talk about some stuff. Uh, something like that happened earlier this year in, in the SIAM Computational Science and Engineering Group. Um, it, it, it's very exciting. So I'm, I'm not going to say that anybody has something locked down way better than everybody else. I think we've identified a few good features, especially features dealing with lots, or I shouldn't say lots of metrics, but multiple metrics, more than one metric you're interested in studying. I think that's a key reason why SIGUP's great. I think if you look at Optuna, they've built a tool which is meant to execute extremely quickly, extremely quickly to be able to do their computation. I think in doing so, you sacrifice a little bit of the performative aspect of things. So if you have a very slow training, you don't need that swift result. But I think that when you need that swift result, which absolutely happens in a variety of black box optimization circumstances, I think Optuna is an, an absolutely fantastic tool. Uh, we have a question here. Are there validation metrics that can detect adversarial examples? A very interesting question, and to be frank, not something that I was necessarily planning on talking about, nor do I frankly feel very confident speaking with great authority on that particular topic. I'm going to throw out one person who I know has been working on this, Mislav Balunovic at ETH Zurich. I'll throw a link in, in the chat later. Um, he's been working... Um, I'm, I'm not going to say specifically on adversarial circumstances, but on robustness. He has been asking, how is it that we can define robustness metrics for neural networks? It is specifically neural networks, though, in my opinion, I don't think it has to be just neural networks, but he has been working mostly on neural networks. He's been asking, how can we build systems which are robust to, I don't know if it's intentionally adversarial circumstances, but let's at least say accidentally adversarial circumstances. And uh, there's been some good work on that. And I will find that link. I will put that in chat. If I don't put that in chat uh, and then by before I leave, please remind me, I'll put that in chat. I think there's, I think there is some good work being done on this. I'm just going to say, I don't know enough of it to be able to comment effectively. We have a question. How to you, how do you validate a model that is recomputed over time that is retrained each month over two year period and determine the best performance? Some time periods may perform better than others. What validation metrics are best used? Fantastic question. Extremely difficult question. I think that this question of, and yeah, you could phrase it in a couple different ways. I think how you phrase it matters. You could say model drift. And in that context, somehow you're talking about this idea that the model that I built last year uh, doesn't continue to work this year. Everybody who spent time in a financial company knows that they get yelled at about this. Everybody gets beat one time when they, they're like, oh, I bet on this and you got beat by the market. It happens. It absolutely happens. Um, I think that in the, in the setting where we're talking about these ML models moving to production, I, I think there's an interesting balance here between a desire to be retraining, and I'm going to throw in not just retraining, I mean really retuning also, asking yourselves at a meta level, 
what do I really know about my space now? How well am I, how well am I able to say this is still generalizing? I think retraining is very important, but in my mind, retuning is also very important. Measuring this drift quantity, watching things shift over time is, I think, extremely beneficial. However, I'm not sure that there is a specific metric. There very well may be a metric where people quantify drift um, and then say after things have drifted beyond some quantity, I don't know. In my mind, I think what most people do is they just, they have their validation metrics. They watch how their validation metrics change over time. I, and once they pass a threshold, they cut back and then pop back in. I think that that's often what people do. I don't know if there's a specific drift metric. If anybody knows of one, please toss that out. Uh, but in my mind, there are people are just watching validation metrics over time, seeing if they, if they violate some level of change and then and then switch it up uh, aaron has thrown out alibi detect i'm not familiar about this but i love it very good some potentially adversarial examples i love hearing about that um we have doug samuelson with a comment computer modelers usual practice digits in images out very good point we could promote a huge advance by requiring digits output along with images so that the next program can read the digits. I think that's a very interesting point. I absolutely could see that. Um, I myself, I don't consider myself part of the computer vision community, did a little imagery construction stuff way back in the day, back when wavelets were the thing. So as you know, that's a long time ago. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I, I think that's, I think it's a very interesting point. This question of when we talk about preserving data or uh, we talk about reproducibility, what does that mean? I think that's a very interesting question. I'll, and again, not something I feel that I have enough expertise to comment on, but absolutely something that I feel like has affected us and affected all of our customers at various times. What is it to be reproducible? I will comment that, and I'm, I'm not saying SigOps solves reproducibility, but I will say that the fact that we have this hosted service where the results of your validation process and, and incorporating some of what I'm going to talk about later as guardrail metrics, the fact that we help store some of this, archive it, persist it, and in particular for companies, persist it even after somebody leaves the company. I do think that helps a little bit for reproducibility or at least interpretability after the fact. But I mean, it's not like we're sitting here trying to address this problem, certainly not from a theoretical perspective. And, and honestly, I think it's, it's an extremely complicated problem that's going to take a lot of people to think about. So um, I'll leave it there. I think we're caught up on questions. Thank you, Guy. I love it. I love it. Let's Bring up questions. I love it. And we don't, honestly, if we don't even finish this talk, I don't care. It's fine. Whatever. There's, you can see the slides online. There are, there's, we can have a great discussion. I love that. So I'm going to click one time. Nope. I'm going to one more time. There we go. Bayesian optimization. Somebody asked about Bayesian optimization. I'm putting here a slide. Uh, there's this link by Bo back, uh, back while he was with, uh, I think, Ryan Adams at MIT. Actually, Maybe this was even before that. Put out this survey paper that talked about Bayesian optimization broadly. I think it's a good quote because it's just tight. It's tight. Sequential model-based approach to optimization. That's all it is. Um, I think sometimes it sounds scary. You hear the word Bayesian and you're like, oh my goodness. In my personal opinion, I don't even think the term Bayesian needs to be there. I think you can talk about this topic, and there are people who use the term surrogate-assisted optimization to explicitly say it's not a stochastic algorithm. So it doesn't have to be. It often is, and a lot of the literature talks about Bayesian optimization as being stochastic because a lot of the information theory community contributes heavily to, to it, and in particular, a lot of ideas from uh, both information theory and then also from sequential decision-making, which is to say maybe more the, uh, the bandit community. These ideas do make their way into the, the Bayesian optimization, or I might use the term BO, the BO community. Um, I, I put this reference here. I also put a little picture here. You can see this article now on archive. Uh, this was joint work we did with Twitter, Facebook, Valahai, the wonderful people of Fort Paradigm, and the CHA Learn Group Challenges and Learning Group. Um, for any of you who attended NeurIPS last year, there was a competition on black box optimization, specifically black box optimization related to hyperparameter tuning. and and uh, people were allowed to do anything they wanted, submit anything they wanted to try and address hyperparameter optimization problems. And, you know, all of the top performing submissions were very, very heavily influenced by Bayesian optimization. Uh, didn't have to be, you could submit anything you wanted, but the best submissions were uh, of that variety. And in particular, I put this little uh, bubble in here to just talk about the comparison between 
the work that was done by the submissions that various people made and the efficiency as compared to random search. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and hate on random search universally. Random search is very useful in all sorts of circumstances. It's just not terribly efficient. If you, if you don't mind being inefficient, it can be the easiest way to scale to arbitrarily high parallelism during your optimization process. If you're trying to be efficient, it's not nearly as efficient as many of these other methods. That's all I'll leave it at. You can read the paper. Everyone who made a submission to the competition, not everyone, but many of them did really outstanding work. They also write up their thoughts in a lot of their own articles. So in this article, you can see links to everybody else's uh, articles. I'm really proud of uh, everybody who made some submissions there. So brief pitch for that. There will be other uh, optimization competitions, not hosted by us, but hosted by others in the future. If you're interested, I hope you check them out. So I have, oh, question, yes. Uh, uh, or comment from um, Majid uh, regarding the time, the idea of this evolution in time. I interpret it like the model of your model. It takes in this time series analysis where you study the effect of time variables. Ideally, obviously, you don't want your model to vary with time. If you see an effect, then, then put in the time effect. I think that's a fair point. I will comment that's a slightly different thing than I was thinking of. Uh, you absolutely can incorporate time into your models to the degree that you have time stored historically in your data and build that in. What I was more thinking about was the idea that you're looking at data uh, sort of time independently. You're looking at a pile of data trying to build a model which is independent of time and then retrain it once you feel that it's performing ineffectively after a certain clip, which you mostly look at, I think, through your validation metrics, which again, were this loss metric or, or any number of other metrics. Uh, that's what I usually think of when I think of this retraining process. I agree, absolutely, you can incorporate time into your model as well if you have the ability to. I also think, and now we're taking our first step from just sort of the standard discussion you get, um, I think even in, in a classroom today. And then, okay, I want to talk about moving to production. And I want to talk about, we have these models that we develop, and I now want these models to succeed as we go to move them into production. Guardrail metrics are a common element in the mix here. And in particular, guardrail metrics, it, it's just a term we use. I think others use it also. I, I think there are other terms for this as well. I'm just going to use guardrail metrics. Represent limitations enforced on the models so as to be viable in production. What is the maximum acceptable inference time? What is the minimum acceptable throughput of inferences? If I am uh, you know, sitting in a national lab somewhere and I have a year to do my work, maybe maximum inference time isn't an issue. If I'm about to deploy my computer vision model to an autonomous vehicle, I don't have five hours to make an inference. I've probably got 50 milliseconds or something like that. Incorporating that into the model development process is the goal of this guardrail metrics topic. I also mentioned here maximum model size, maximum power. Again, key elements of model success when you go to deploy them to edge devices, when you go to deploy them to IoT settings. And here I'm going to put model interpretability and application specific needs. I'll put model interpretability as its own specific thing. You know, a lot of times when we talk about interpretability, it has a very vague sense. When we talk about uh, random forests, it can have a very specific sense. How many decisions are you making on your way? What is the depth of the trees that make up your random forest? If you are worried about being able to explain what your model is doing to an auditor, in the future, you want to cap model interpretability. You want to be able to make sure you can explain that. I think that can be a key guardrail metric. Uh, I see some comments here. Somebody's looked into Bayesian optimization for retraining and updating the model based on new data. One of the difficulties of these Bayesian methods, they take very long to train. How you tackle this challenge? Uh, very legitimate question. Um, and, and realistically, sample efficiency is very difficult. I will try and talk about that a little bit later on. I don't think I can comment concisely about it now, but I'm happy to, to, to think about it in a broader context later on. Uh, could also include governance metrics, absolutely, model fairness, 100%, abs absolutely. I think that especially now that we're getting better as a community at producing um, ways to quantify fairness, 
uh, ethical behavior of models. I absolutely think these can be key guardrail metrics, which again, the goal of guardrail metric is to disqualify models. It's to say, no, 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 no. I don't care how good your model is. If it doesn't satisfy some minimum amount of fairness or interpretability or, or some maximum model size, it's just not going to play. It's not going to work. So uh, that's the goal of guardrail metrics. Fantastic point. Uh, thank you very much for bringing that up. All right, let me click forward. So now we're starting to talk about having multiple metrics. How is it that we optimize multiple metrics? It's a complicated question. And anybody who's dealt with mathematical optimization is going to tell you this is a complicated question. A naive approach and one that can work very well in all sets of circumstances is, well, why don't I just create one metric out of three metrics? I have multiple metrics. I create a scalar metric instead. That can work. And here I have an example. Okay, I can create a composite metric where I add up a little bit of accuracy, a little bit of model size, and a little bit of flops. Flops is computational element, how much power is being drawn, basically. You can absolutely do that. But then you sort of end up at this complicated point. Why is this the right balance between these three metrics? And in reality, I don't know anybody who knows the answer to that. There is no right balance right away. That's, that's why uh, something like a regularization parameter, when you have to set your lasso quantity, your lasso quantity is doing the exact same thing. It's adding up a little bit of your loss function with a little bit of the complexity of your model or somehow the, the sum of the weights of your model. What's the right answer there? Nobody knows. That's why you always have to find the right lasso quantity or the right L2 regularization quantity every time you choose a, a model that you're trying to train. Picking this is a very nice strategy when you can do it. Most of the time, I can't do it at least. If you can do it, please pass on, pass on the wisdom. I just don't know how. And I think in many circumstances, even when you come up with a solution for this, it's very application specific, is very targeted to exactly one circumstance and really doesn't end up being portable. That's been my experience at least. So if we don't feel like we can take the naive approach, there we are, what can we do? And I'm going to propose that we can do, as this is the slide I thought it was gonna be, that we can use this Pareto efficient frontier. What is the Pareto efficient frontier? Pareto efficient frontier helps to explore the trade-off between two metrics. Now, does it have to be two metrics? No, you can have a lot of metrics, but I can only look at two metrics easily. So we're going to start with two metrics. Okay. When we say to ourselves, okay, I need to balance accuracy, but I also need to deal with fast inference. Uh, minimizing inference speed. Uh, can we find models that maximize one and minimize the other? Uh, the answer is uh, maybe, but in reality, there's always a balance here. There's always a balance. And the key core element is this Pareto frontier. This is what is often defined as the quote unquote solution in these multi-objective settings. Now there's been, like I said, there's been a lot, of, a lot of fine work on this topic by a lot of outstanding people over the years, but a lot of it often deals with a theoretical approach to it. And that, that can be extremely useful and can motivate some numerical strategies, but they rarely provide feasible strategies, especially from a sample efficient perspective. And I think earlier Lizzie commented that there are, uh, this process can be very slow. This process of, of dealing with validation metrics can be very slow. And what I, what I really wanna emphasize is that these mathematical optimization strategies can be a little bit sample heavy, at least, let's say. So we might try and get a little more efficient in that. I'm not going to get too much into the numerical algorithms that we use internally. I'm happy to, but in all honesty, I think it's kind of boring. It, it's not that it's boring. It's only interesting to specific communities. And I want to, I want to talk at a little more high level. If we want to get deep down in the weeds, we can do it after we get through a little bit more of this talk. Okay. I'm showing here this Pareto frontier. What is the Pareto frontier? Pareto frontier is the result that says I cannot do any better in one metric without hurting the other metric. Every point on this Pareto frontier is considered equally good or equally efficient. And I have this term here, efficient, Pareto efficiency. I don't know who the, the Pareto person, well, I actually don't, I feel like a, a, a very ill-informed now. Somebody named Pareto at some point came up with the Pareto concept of Pareto efficiency. The frontier is the idea. This is the set of all efficient points. Now, what I'm drawing here on the left-hand side is the set of all efficient points in metric space. 
So I'm plotting here metric accuracy, metric speed, and these are all the outcomes that I am able to achieve, roughly speaking, all the outcomes. These outcomes are defined by what I've defined in parameter space. And I've drawn here two very vague graphs in parameter space. I've got two parameters, an X parameter, a Y parameter. I haven't even defined them. I don't really even care what they are. Doesn't really matter that much. But we have a comment. Vilfredo Pareto, thank you. Taught me today, I learned. Thank you very much. I love it. Um, and I will pass, a, pass that on to everybody else here at the company. Somebody else probably knew. I probably was just the one that didn't know. Um, so here we're looking at what's going on in parameter space. And here I've got one graph for accuracy, one graph for speed. But that's usually not how we look at things. Not that we don't want to, but usually we don't just have two parameters. Usually we have like 10 parameters. And usually some of them are categorical. So that's why looking at it here in metric space can be a useful uh, element for um, studying what the trade-off is. Here we have Catherine Olson commenting, yes, and, and Pareto optimality, Pareto efficiency. This topic arose in economics. This is one of the ML people who invented this. This topic arose in economics. And, uh, and yeah, very, very good. That's exactly, Doug, I see you with the comment there. Uh, at some point, you know, there's this there's this balance. At some point, you can only improve accuracy so much without hurting speed or improve any metric, metric without hurting other metrics. A situation where all metrics can be optimized simultaneously would be considered a, a non-likely situation, very rare, not, not common to occur. So this is one way to study multiple metrics. How do you address this? You can address this. There's some fantastic research by a lot of people on multi-objective Bayesian optimization right now. Uh, some great people at Washington State University, uh, uh, Sarash Belakaria and, and her group. Uh, Facebook, Eitan Bakshi's group has done some good work on this. Recently, uh, the folks at Deakin and Sveta's lab, uh, her team is doing really fantastic work. We have a paper out on it. Actually, interestingly, not in an ML journal, it's in a material science journal um, on it. Operations research. So here we have uh, Kalizuski's work. This is a fantastic point is that a lot of communities, machine learning is talking about this now, but operations research is talking about this very heavily right now. So there's a lot of really great work going on on this. Um, and, and I think that if you, if you want to get involved in this topic, you want to use this topic, there's a lot of great tools out there. I mentioned some open source stuff. And as I mentioned, of course, you can feel free to use SIGOP. Um, I'll also comment that this is another strategy. I put this here, metrics as constraints. In some ways, I might argue that imposing these guardrail metrics as constraints might even be more natural than studying Pareto efficiency. Pareto efficiency is this very useful... Uh, boy, that mouse is touchy. Uh, for studying the trade-off between different metrics. And here you can see some sort of understanding of the trade-off between, in this case, size and accuracy. But if size is being enforced as a constraint, sort of just as a, as a guardrail, more or less, can't go past this. Anything else you do is fine, but you can't go past this. As a model size must be less than some result. The outcome is different because the goal is different. The goal isn't to understand the trade-offs. When we talk about multi-objective optimization, the goal is look at the trade-offs. When we talk about constraints, we're saying do as well as you can in this metric subject to a threshold on some other metrics. And we see here that the results that we get, and here we have blue, the solution that we get for the metric constraints where we impose this 0.15, so 150,000 parameters at most in our neural network. This was a neural architecture search problem. Um, you know, we, we're just sort of searching right around here. We're saying, okay, I want to get to 0.15, but I don't really want to get any lower than that unless it's helping me get a better accuracy. And once that trade-off starts to kick in, we don't search that at all. We're not looking at any of these results over here at all, because what we're trying to do is maximize accuracy. So I'm trying to push as far as I can in the top direction, subject to something which in, in this case, fits inside this box. I'm not interested in any of these results over here, even if they give me better accuracy, which turns out they will. And that's 
uh, imposing metrics as constraints. Constrained optimization is, again, another aspect of arguably mathematical optimization. It's also an aspect of sequential decision making. It's also an aspect of operations research and how to address this. Again, there's a lot of work I should have put. I have some good citations for this one. I should have put some good citations on. Uh, again, there's some fantastic labs doing some outstanding work. Uh, the Amazon Basing Optimization Team has been dealing with this, I think, very well. Uh, recently, uh, Bobby Gramercy, who's actually in a business school, if I'm not mistaken, Virginia Tech, now business school, has been doing fantastic work. And there actually is some great work being done in business schools right now, which is happening more and more as the bandit community is finding uh, positions at faculty, uh, faculty positions at business schools. Uh, so, so there's a lot of really great people imposing constraints on optimization and trying to, to produce the right models. Again, why is this important? Because guardrail metrics tell us what is viable. What is an acceptable model? In this case, acceptable model is I need it to be less than this number of parameters. Once I account for that, I just kind of want this point right here, highest accuracy, or somehow these points, some, the result that, that is represented by these points. Just want that highest accuracy. So that's not the trade-off. Uh, let me go, boom, there we are. Beyond two metrics. I said I'd talk about this. Well, I kind of, I'll talk about it for this long and then we're not gonna talk about it anymore. Dealing with more than two metrics is in my opinion, best done through these constraints. Impose constraints, impose thresholds on your metrics. Because at the end of the day, when you try and study things from this pure multi-criteria, multi-objective, I use the term multi-metric a lot. I'm sorry, that's just a term we use. Multi-objective and multi-criteria are the more common terms in the community. When you look at these multi-criteria Pareto frontiers for more than two metrics, you're talking about a surface. And in this particular case, maybe if depending on how mathy you are, you might use the term manifold. You're talking about an M minus one dimensional surface or manifold in this M dimensional space in which your metrics lie. I don't feel comfortable visualizing that. That's extremely hard to do, but push that a step further. How many points lie on that manifold? Now you could argue, and I think this is of course accurate, when we look at this Pareto frontier, arguably infinitely many points lie on this Pareto frontier right? From a purely mathematical perspective. Now, of course, from a practical perspective, there's a limited precision with which these accuracy and speed quantities can be defined. So it's not actually infinite, but let me double down on this and say it is noisy. When we talk about a point being on or off the frontier, that is a theoretically noiseless comment. When we click in and look at this picture, there we are right here, these points have an amount of noise defined for them. Even if it's a deterministic computation, the data that you've accumulated was noisy. So at the end of the day, the fact that this point isn't on the frontier, but this one is, I don't think that's an appropriate distinction. It's not a feasible distinction at the level of specificity with which we've accumulated data, nor with the level of specificity at which we expect these models to operate going forward. Because again, the data on which we've trained is not the data on which we need these things to execute. So uh, for my money, actually defining a pure Pareto frontier isn't is it necessary? And defining this point as the answer in this constrained situation, I don't think that's necessary. I think we we look at the results that we've got. We have to we have to sort of make a decision after that because there is noise present in these situations, which is why, for my money, I don't, again, don't know. Uh, it's not really appropriate to go beyond two metrics, and maybe even maybe even sometimes talking about the raw optimality of two metrics is a little bit dubious in my opinion. We're gonna talk about that in just a second, but just, that's just why you're not gonna see me sh showing any three or four dimensional Pareto frontiers, it's not gonna happen. It's a very reasonable thing to talk about theoretically, but just from a practical per per perspective, I don't think it's useful. Uh, I also think it's impractical from a, a number of samples perspective. Like if you wanna approximate a four dimensional surface, how many points do you need to do that with any accuracy, with any, with any legitimacy? Hundreds, thousands? I don't know, a lot, I think. And who has time to do a thousand trainings of their model? No, I, mean, I don't, maybe, maybe you do if it's a small enough model, but in general, I think a lot of us are trying to do as few trainings as possible. So we don't have the capacity to do these things. And again, I put just a little dot, dot, dot here. What could be demanded to manage this high number of metrics? There isn't an easy solution. It's difficult. You want to deal with lots of metrics. You have to do one of two things. Either you need more computation or less precision. 
And that's really the one cool new thing, totally novel that you are going to see here today, is this idea that I'm going to replace this desire for optimality with a recognition that we're probably not going to get the optimal result anyways, because optimal is noisy and ill-defined and isn't really going to matter when I go to put this thing in production anyways. Let me push this button one time. There we go. Talk a little bit about production metrics. Production metrics might include something like click-through rate tomorrow, not the click-through rate you're training on, the click-through rate tomorrow. You can't measure that. You have no idea what that is. What if COVID is suddenly gone tomorrow? That's probably going to change click-through rates, right? And I tell you what, the first day that first COVID case hit, that might have started to change some click-through rates also. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know how much profit you're going to make over the next month. You don't know the failure probability of something you're building in a new market. At the end of the day, production metrics are things you can't possibly compute today. You cannot possibly incorporate these during your validation process. Doesn't mean you don't want to incorporate them somehow, but you really can't take, these aren't numbers that you can get. At the end of the day, making final decisions about deployment involves multiple stakeholders and experts in a project. Now it doesn't always, but the recommender system that I assume Netflix uses to tell me what, I think there's a, probably a lot of people in the process that's saying, gee, I want it to be this where I care about this quantity. I care about how long somebody scrolls through the Netflix queue before they click the button. I care about how long they, they scroll horizontally instead of vertically. I care, do they trust our recommendations? I care how much time they spend on the system, blah, blah, blah. It's a whole bunch of things, whole bunch of stakeholders. Dealing with them is fundamental to the eventual de successful deployment of your model, but dealing with them during development is very, very, very hard to do. Some might argue impossible to do. What can you do? Well, what you can do is you can store a lot of metrics during your development process. That doesn't mean you necessarily optimize these metrics, but you can compute and store a lot of metrics. And here's an example from... I think a uh, deep learning recommender system that we were working on. I put here AUC, average inference latency, average test throughput, training throughput, training time, five metrics. I'm only optimizing one. I'm only optimizing AUC here. But I put all of these metrics in because later on, somebody may ask me, oh, but what if I did this? Can't you do this? Can't you show me something like this? Now you've got a little bit of backup. Now you've got a little bit of ammo when that expert comes to you and says, oh, but couldn't you do this? Well, I've been computing this and I don't think that's going to be possible. Will that dissuade the expert? Who knows? Point is, here's a little bit of information. Second thing you can do is study some of these quantities that say, okay, well, some of these parameters that I'm studying, these, these meta parameters, learning rate parameters, batch size parameters, they only seem to affect one metric and not the other. Here I'm using this importance quantity. This importance quantity that I'm showing you is just a quantity that's used, you guys know, when you do these random forests, you get scikit-learn.fit, but then you also have these dot importances underscore quantities at the end. Here I'm just putting these, these importance quantities, the same quantities that would appear if you were doing a functional ANOVA on the relationship between these hyperparameters and the resulting metrics that you're studying. If you can tell somebody, well, look, I'm messing with this now, and I promise you this quantity does not affect this AUC quantity that you care so much about, that also can help you deal with experts at your company. Couple quick little thoughts, and now I get to something cool, something I'm very proud of something I'm very proud of SIGOPT at, we have a really great research team here. Um, and I'm very proud of the work that they've been able to do. In particular, asking and trying to answer, not answering, but trying to answer this question. Production metrics are still fundamentally unknown at training time. How can you possibly optimize a metric which is unknown? I don't know. I mean, realistically, you can't. Right. Realistically, you can't optimize a metric which you can't see. The goal is find a diverse set of configurations or decisions, modeling decisions that are good. And the hope is the fact that they are diverse will allow one of them to be well performing during production. When I say well performing during production, I also really mean even get to production. Hopefully one of this diverse set of models that you are finding, this broad set of models that you're finding, will be satisfactory to all the experts and all the stakeholders that you're going to have to talk to eventually. The goal here is trade the sense of optimality 
that we're looking for when we often do this tuning process and instead say, okay, let me just find a lot of things that are good enough and figure out how those are going to perform successfully. Roxana, diverse according to what criteria? Fantastic question. Right now I'm talking about pure, purely diversity in hyperparameter space. I think it's also viable to talk about diversity in metric space, but the research we've done only talks about diversity in hyperparameter space right now. I talk about in particular this top, this tool, Constraint Active Search. It's a tool for producing a broad set of models, all of which meet specific performance thresholds. So we set performance thresholds in metric space, and then we talk about diversity in hyperparameter space. And in particular, I put a link here to this paper. We presented this at ICML this year. Um, and there was also a workshop paper on this at the NeurIPS workshop on machine learning for engineering in December. Um, it is a, it, we, we treat it very sort of theoretically here, but I think it's a very, very reasonable topic to talk about. And darn it, I'm going to be click. Okay, good. The way that I think it's very interpretable, it's very easy concept is that I'm going to replace this topic of maximize accuracy subject to all the constraints that I'm interested in. I am going to get rid of accuracy altogether, I'm, I'm, maximization altogether. And I am instead going to replace it with all constraints, all constraints, no optimality. I no longer care about finding the most accurate model, the fastest model, the smallest model. I only care about finding all the possible models that I can build that satisfy some set of constraints. Now, this does require users of this algorithm to state these constraints. I'm not saying that's trivial. That can be complicated. But the nice thing about this, in my opinion, is these are all interpretable. Under the assumption that these metrics are themselves interpretable, these quantities, some sort of accuracy, 80% accurate, 90% accurate, whatever, those should also be interpretable. So I think that this is a reasonable expectation for many practitioners to have available to them. Let me oh, turn it. Now I'm going to hit it once. Did that? No. Okay, there we go. Okay, good. And I'm going to produce this graph for you here, which is going to compare Bayesian optimization, in this case, multi-objective Bayesian optimization, against other strategies that we could consider as being viable tools for producing good models. And in particular, I have on the top, again, parameter space, these graphs in parameter space. And I have on the bottom, the graphs in metric space. So I have F1, F2, metric one, metric two. They're just abstract at this point. It doesn't really matter what they are. And I've set some thresholds that I'm interested in. This does ignore parts of the Pareto frontier, but I've set some thresholds that I'm interested in. And here you can see a pretty decent approximation of what the Pareto frontier is. The Pareto frontier in metric space is this whole region here. The Pareto frontier in parameter space is just this line right here. So if we just approach this the standard way we would approach multi-objective optimization, the answer, quote unquote, is just this line. That's all the answer is. That's all we'd be looking for. In metric space, that would represent these outcomes here, where you cannot improve one metric without sacrificing the other metric. And that is a very good outcome. What it doesn't do is it doesn't explore parameter space at all. It's literally meant to just be one line in parameter space. What we want to do is back off. And we want to say, I don't really care if a point is, is exactly on the frontier or not, because it's noisy and because tomorrow is going to look different than today is. So instead of trying to search for just the points on the Pareto frontier, what I want to do is I want to use these thresholds that we have here to define a satisfactory region. And this satisfactory region in metric space corresponds to a satisfactory region in parameter space, which is this blue, take care, Doug, thank you very much for joining, a blue sort of football shaped region up here. My goal is to explore this blue football shaped region up here as much as I can. Find every possible outcome that I can inside this blue football shaped region and do so in a sample efficient fashion because I don't have all day. 
The outline of this blue region can be found using level set estimation, a tool which is kind of common in certain statistical communities, in particular statistical design of experiments community. So this outline of this region can be a very important piece of information, but it's not really what I'm looking for. Again, I want to fill up this space. I want my diverse set of outcomes. I want the whole space. I want all the possible models that I can find inside this space because this space represents what is satisfactory to me. And that is what constraint active search is trying to do. Constraint active search is an algorithm which is trying to fill up this space in, in parameter space subject to your metric thresholds. Now you can see here, it also happens to fill it up a little bit in metric space, but eh, that's just sort of incidental. That's just incidental. That's a function of how the parameters and metrics interact. I'm going to comment when you look at the outcome in this space, trying to fill up this space, it kind of looks a lot like random search, right? It kind of looks just like a random smattering of points. And when you compare it to random search, you're right. It does look a lot just like we're doing random search. The point is I'm not doing random search over the whole parameter domain. I'm only trying to do random search over the satisfactory region, which is why you don't see so many points in the rest of the, maybe we call it unsatisfactory outcomes, the outcomes that don't satisfy all the metrics that we're interested in. How do we use constraint active search? Oh, I forgot I added these little things. Well, there we go. How do you use constraint active search? Right now, I think there are three logical ways to use constraint active search. One of them is in this multi-armed bandits context. A lot of times when you have these online systems where you're trying to populate the different arms that you can pull while you're making in particular, I think often recommender systems, you have to ask yourselves how you're going to populate these arms. Right now, people just populate them and they test them and they see which ones tend to perform better. And that's how they run the multi-armed bandits. I believe that constraint active search can be a useful tool for populating the arms of your multi-armed bandit systems. I also think it can be a useful tool for model ensembling in these circumstances where various people are trying to make decisions about, I think we were looking at loan data here maybe, or, or I'm not sure exactly what it was. Um, you may be interested in coming up with in particular an interpretable ensemble in a situation where you want to build simple models that end up at the end of each of these decisions that you're willing to consider in your model. You have the ability to design this structure up here and then populate each of these with models that are found through constraint active search so as to perform very well for each of these subsections of your parameter space. And then in turn, I'll also, and I've mentioned, nope, there we go. I've mentioned uh, experts and stakeholders a lot in this particular system. And I put this example here, uh, you know, what is the best soup? I don't know. It probably involves a little bit of broth, some noodles, some amount of temperature, time, maybe some meat, maybe some veggies. How do you cook the best soup? I, I mean, that's just an extremely difficult thing to say, but an expert, some person who's really good at tasting soups is going to be able to tell you what's a good soup and what is not a good soup. But you can't use an expert all through your model building process. What you can do is find five good models and give them to an expert, in this case, Gauss, to test and see which one is the best. And that is one of the goals of constraint active search, to be able to produce a very nice, tight set, all of which are satisfactory outcomes and then pass those on to your stakeholders and your experts so they can approve hopefully one of them for production. And with that, I will basically conclude managing ML metrics involves understanding how success is defined and pursuing models which fit those criteria. That is the goal. Let me put one more slide marketing set. I had to put this in. SIGOPT is available for free. Try our product if you would like. Click here. There's a link, app.sigop.com slash sign up. I would love to hear from any of you. Again, more thoughts. You gave some great questions here. I absolutely love that. And I'm happy to pursue any of those further if we'd like. Otherwise, I would just leave it to broad questions right now. Well, thank you, Michael, for a fascinating talk. Um, if, if I can just say personally, I am delighted to hear that SIGOPT is now available for free uh, to everyone. Um, I, I've been a SIGOPT user uh, for a, a few years, wow. and uh, I'm, I'm using it as part of my dissertation research. And so, hey. uh, outstanding! That is outstanding to hear. My 
motto when I joined this company six years ago was empower the world's experts. And that is what I wanted to do. And I am so glad to hear that it's helped. I hope it's helping. I hope you're not using it to say how terrible it is. But if you are, that's fine. That could be your research too. Uh, but that's great. That makes my day. I'm so happy to hear that. Thank you. No, I, I, I am a huge fan. So, um, you know, it, uh, uh, I've had, had conversations with some, some of the leadership there saying, man, I wish we could get this in the hands of more people. And, uh, you know, thanks to, to Intel that's now available. So, yes. uh, yes. per personally very happy about that. Um, for those that, uh, uh, remain, you know, I, I would say, um, you know, continue throwing some questions if you have them in, in the chat. I will read them to Michael uh, and uh, we can continue the conversation for uh, the next little bit if, uh, uh, if and I'm going like. to find, I know I promised somebody that paper by Mislav. I'm going to find that right now on, uh, here it is, certifying geometric robustness of neural networks. So that's not quite exactly what uh, the, the, the question was, let me get the reference here. Uh, but that does, I think, speak to this question of how is it people build systems that are robust to, to problems or nefariousness or what have you. Where's the link? There's the link. Uh, is there a link for your slides? Let me, boom, let me close this. You don't need to look at the slides anymore. Here we go. Uh, I do not know if, uh, I probably have not sent it yet, which is a boo-boo on my part. I am going to put that in chat right now uh, because there were a few links in there. I also will try and spend some time going through and putting a couple more links in. I know I referenced some papers earlier and did not have links and that was sloppy on my part, so I will fix that. Boom. Copy link and putting it in. There's chat. Here you go. Mm. Oh, thank you guys. Yeah, I, I, I really, I, I love, I love being, I love, being, I love chatting with anybody who's got questions and wants to talk about stuff. That's one of the reasons I love going to the workshops so much is you really get an audience that wants to engage. Sometimes you give a talk at a very stodgy conference and, and everybody's like, mm -hmm. I like, uh, I like mixing it up. So thank you guys. Thank you guys for, for, for voicing your questions. I really appreciate it. Well, you know, some, someday if we get back in person, uh, maybe we can host you uh, at an in-person data science DC event, uh, which oh, I would love that. there we're often in an auditorium so it's less interactive during your talk, but understood. Uh, you know, there's pizza or empanadas beforehand, so lots of, mix of that. Up. And then we uh, will will often a, a sub a subset of us will retire to data drinks at a uh, local watering hole afterwards. Nice. So nice, nice, um, nice. Love to hear it. If if it looks like um, yeah, we all love the empanadas, Aaron. Um, if, uh, uh, if we're waiting for, for anyone else to ask, or if there's not any more questions, I have uh, a question for you and I'm, I'm happy to just take your time to, to help me noodle through, uh, Absolutely. my, my of current course. problem. So if, if, if one has, um, several metrics that you need to optimize for, um, and, and, in, you know, so more than two, for example, right. So, uh, I think in my case. I actually have two parameters on three different distributions, so six. Okay. Do you have like uh, uh, any any thoughts on strategies for uh, approaching that that problem, um, uh, either using SIGOPT or or just in general, or something where it's else, this, yeah. this sort of multi metric, mm -hmm. ma many metric uh, optimization problem. So in this particular case, you have a situation where, um, and let me let me think about it for a moment. Um, when you say two parameters, uh, what do you, um, or maybe maybe I can think about this for a moment. You've got you're talking about you're trying to to make a decision on two parameters, or you're trying to. Um... So the um, what I'm working on, and by the way, folks, I don't mean to monopolize the time, but uh, if you got any other questions. <laughs> I'm Fire always off, happy to answer I, questions I like this. Off, but um, so uh, what I what I'm doing is simul simulating data, 
but I want my to constrain my simulation so that it, it retains the statistical properties of sort of like a, a, a real world data set. And those properties uh, are three, three distributions that uh, can be parameterized with two parameters each. I see, I see, I see. And so what I'm measuring is, you know, basically minimize the error on these two. It's basically uh, take my real data, calculate those parameters, generate a synthetic data set, calculate those parameters on them, and then get the error and, um, you know, wash, rinse, repeat in that optimization mm -hmm. loop. Mm -hmm. um, but given how many uh, parameters I'm, I'm sort of optimizing there, I'm sort of wondering if, you know, there is a, an optimal strategy versus just mm -hmm. say, you know, run simulations to optimize for each one and then do like parallel coordinates and stare at them, which is currently what I'm currently what I'm doing. It's an interesting question. Um, I think I think part of the question here is what and just speaking structurally, part of the question is what does optimum mean? What does optimization here? Do all six of these have are all all uh, um i'd have to i think i'd have to dig in slightly more to have a holistic a real a real approach to this though i i have some thoughts um sure. uh i think that the first question is okay you've got a lot of definitions of success is it that you want to optimize each of those in like not independently but somehow um to, to find the optimum of each of those uh, definitions of success, or is it somehow that you want a result which is, is sufficiently good for all of the metrics on which you define success? Do you feel that you need basically six different answers, six different points in the situation you're talking about? Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe I can make this a bit more concrete and, Please. um, just, just for full disclosure to everyone, Michael is now helping me uh, do my PhD research. So uh, thank you. I Michael. miss. I very much. I <laughs> many years ago I was postdoc at University of Colorado. I love teaching. I really miss teaching. So I, I the students. It's my, the only regret I have about going to industry is not being able to work with students. So please, it's my day. It's my pleasure. So um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll make my my problem as concrete as I can. Um, I am trying to simulate uh, word frequencies of uh, human language. Interesting. And um, you know, if you grab any corpus of human language, uh, you're going to see you know, these power law distributions fall out. Some famous mm -hmm. ones, uh, Zipp's law is the most famous. There's another one called Heap's law, which is a relationship between uh, the number of number of words and number of unique words. Uh, and then uh, there's one from ecology called Taylor's Law, but can actually be reapplied in a, in a linguistic framework. Interesting. And um, the, the, all three are power law distributions. They appear everywhere where, where one has language. Uh, the parameters might be slightly different for each different corpus, but the, in general, the relationships stay the same. Uh, I am using a simulation method that is, you know, drawing from probability distributions, not at all how language happens in real life, uh, but maybe reasonable approximation. Mm -hmm. There's lots of ways you can parameterize those probability distributions that will look absolutely nothing like human language. Agreed. And so I'm trying to constrain my space mm -hmm. to say what parameter choices can I make that will generate things that... Mm -hmm. Could, could be like human language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So each one of those three power law distributions, mm -hmm. um, the way I'm measuring it is with a regression and log log space, which is yep. also not the best, but eh, it's not, it's fine. not the worst. It's a way. Yeah. So, yep. you know, you've got your intercept and you've got your, um, yep. I see. Uh, 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 your weight there. So, yep. Um, Yep, yep, you know, yep, yep. I see. And yeah, so yeah. now you've got six mechanisms for defining how successful or six, six metrics for defining how successful it is. One option would be add them all up, just like we said earlier, right? Hey, just add them all up. Now you've got one metric, a hey, problem yep. solved. As the old joke about a mathematician tries to join the fire department. 
Uh, Fire Chief said, hey, fantastic. You did a great job on all the tests. We'll hire you. One more question. I, you see that dumpster over there? What do you do if the dumpster's on fire? Mathematician says, no, I put it, take the fire hose, put it out. Fire Chief said, fantastic. What do you do if the dumpster's not on fire? Mathematician said, that's easy. I set it on fire because that's a problem I know how to solve. So <laughs> at the end of the day, if you uh, want to try and approach it with tools you already have in play, there's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. There's even a more complicated, but potentially more useful way, tricky. Instead of doing the sum of it, do something like the min of the six. So like minimize the min or the max of the six or something like that. Um, and and that, will, that will be one quick way. I'm just talking about quick ways to get this in the mix, to get it happening. Another option would be instead of looking at uh, fitting it with this, this uh, sort of a QQ fit or fitting it in log log space, which is perfectly fine. Again, there's nothing wrong with that. You could also look at quantiles and you could say to yourself, okay, do the quantiles of the different distributions that I'm studying match up? Um, not that I specifically think that's better or worse, but it is somehow, again, slightly more interpretable. And I just, I'm a, I love when things are interpretable because then, number one, I know if they go wrong or I can detect it, detect a little bit better if they're going wrong. Whereas if it's like, okay, the intercept is off a little bit, it's like, do I care about that more than the slope or not? I'm not sure. Yeah. It's one reason why I like it. And the other reason why I like um, quantiles is you can use them any way you want. You take 10 quantiles and you just take the average of them. Fine, it's fine. But it's like, I don't, it, it feels like I'm, oh, I'm getting my hands on, I can do what I want with it. That's another thought, but those, are, those aren't really answering your question. Those are just different ways you could define metrics to, to define the validity or legitimacy of your sampling strategy, your simulation strategy and the eventual outcome. I'm gonna say, if you want, and I'll 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 mention whether you, whether you want to use what's in SIGAP right now, or I'd be happy, of course, and I'll throw this out to all of you. Part of the research team's goal is always finding exciting new collaborations. If you'd like, I mean, we could make sure a version of Constraint Active Search is built exactly for your situation. The reason I bring that up is because the goal is very much exactly like what you're talking about here. If you have a um, definition of what acceptable is. And you don't, again, you don't need it a priori, you can tune it as you go along. But if you have a definition for what acceptable is, you can kind of start with a big domain of possible parameters and then zoom in on the region where all the metrics seem to be pretty good on average. Now, one question I'll ask is, um, the, the slope and the intercept, if these aren't on the, law, the right, the same scale as each other, and in particular, if they're not on the same scale across all three problems, that might require or might benefit from a little normalization in that particular setting. But beyond that, honestly, it could work relatively well. And if you'd like to talk further about this, uh, it could absolutely be a uh, it could it could absolutely be something at least that gets you like you were talking about finding the domain of acceptable outcomes or the viable outcomes. I think that that is what we designed constrained active search for. It also, as I mentioned, scales independently of the number of metrics. You can throw as many metrics as you want in it and it works. But the downside is you don't get the answer. So if what you're looking for is the answer here, then arguably somehow what you need to do is make one metric. If you have one metric, you get one answer. So if you can push all six into one metric, that can give you one answer. If what you're trying to do is just find an answer, which is good enough to push forward on it, to be frank, and I know this contradicts literally everything I just talked about in my talk, but the easiest thing to do is make one metric. Make one metric, shove it in, because your research isn't on coming up with this thing. It's somehow using it, right? Like somehow you're trying to study it for, for bigger purposes. This is just a means to an end. So the, the quickest way you could get there is just to do that. If you want to do something more lab, I'd be happy to interact with you on. I'd be happy to, 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 yeah, like I said, we're always looking for collabs, especially on the constraint active search side, because I think there's a lot of cool applications for it. I think this could be one of them. I'll throw that out there. Well, I certainly have your email and, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, be careful what you offer because somebody might take you up on it. So uh, I, yeah, I, I'd be happy to chat to chat more. Very um, good, very good. And we can uh, we can right. call it here. I know we're over time, so thank you all for staying late. Yeah, well, and 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 thank you for indulging my my line of questions about my own research. Um, Absolutely. So, Michael, again, great talk. Uh, you know, for the audience, uh, forgive me for sounding like a shill, but like I said, I've used SIGOPT for several years, and now that it is free and available to everyone, uh, I would say, 
go go try it out. Yeah, give it a shot. Let us know if you like it, and please let us know if you don't like it. All right. Absolutely. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks again, Michael. Take care, everyone. Thank you.